So both voluntary euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide are fully legalized in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And I put in Colombia in brackets because the Colombia Supreme Court a few years ago said that there was a right to euthanasia. But it sort of called on Parliament to make regulations and laws to do this, which Parliament has never done. So the situation seems somewhat grey um, in Colombia. I understand there have been cases of euthanasia that have been practiced. I don't know if we have anyone here from Colombia who has any greater knowledge of this than I do. Um, but uh, that's my understanding of the situation. Um, and physician-assisted suicide is legal now in four states of the United States, Oregon, Washington, uh, Montana, and Vermont, which uh, Montana was a court decision, and the other three had uh, voter initiatives, which they passed. Uh, Switzerland uh, also allows physician-assisted suicide, and again, Germany is in brackets because the legal situation is not completely clear as I understand it. <clears throat> um, but uh, it doesn't seem to be a crime. It may just be that you have an obligation to render assistance. Um, so that complicates the situation. Um, it's interesting that the three jurisdictions in which this is legal are all neighbors. The first one of these to legalize uh, voluntary euthanasia was the Netherlands which for many years, going back to the 1980s, had a kind of de facto practice of physicians were able to practice voluntary euthanasia following a court decision, which uh, in a case said that the physician had faced a conflict of duties, um, on the one hand the duty not to kill, and on the other hand the duty to aid the patient, the physician's duty to assist his patient, and uh, essentially uh, acquitted the doctor on that ground. And then the, the prosecutors, the uh, equivalent of the district attorneys in this country, uh, basically said, well, we're not going to prosecute physicians for doing this if they comply with certain guidelines. And the guidelines were set out by the Royal Dutch Medical Association. So for many years, there was a practice that was not legalized. It was fully legalized in 2002. And around the same time, Belgium, um, legalized it as well, and then Luxembourg followed a few years later. Now, the interesting thing about this, which is worth bearing in mind, um, given that you're, you're going to hear or read uh, criticisms of the situation in the Netherlands, is that after this practice had already existed for um, at least 15 years in the Netherlands, the, firstly, the, the Dutch government, as I said, legalized it. Secondly, the country that is closest to the Netherlands, not only in terms of geographically, but also culturally, um, legalized it soon after. Because uh, about, uh, I think, more than half of the population of Belgium actually speaks uh, Flemish, which is equivalent, really, to Dutch. So people who speak Flemish can watch Dutch television, for example, with no problem. They can read Dutch newspapers. They are in a better position than anybody else, really, to know what is going on in the Netherlands. And the fact that they decided, or their parliament decided, to introduce a law more or less identical with that in the Netherlands suggests that they at least did not uh, think that there was something really terrible happening in that country. And then Luxembourg, as I say, followed suit soon after. Um, in the case of the United States, we also, until, the, uh, until just the, uh, November last year, we had the, the ballot in Vermont, that election had passed. Until then, we also had a kind of a geographical cluster of states. Um, Oregon was the first to legalize physician-assisted suicide uh, by a voter initiative. Washington followed suit. Uh, Montana, as I say, by a court decision. And then we got uh, the first state out of that northwest corner to legalize it uh, by the referendum last year, and it only came into effect earlier this year. So in all of these cases, there are guidelines. I'm not going to go through these in great detail now, but I'll put the slides up so that um, you can look at them more closely. Uh, the guidelines are slightly different in the Netherlands from those in Oregon and Washington, apart from the fact that they allow uh, the physician to give a lethal injection. 
Um, there's a reference here to unremitting and unbearable suffering. Um, and importantly, the patient does not have to be terminally ill. Um, so you could be suffering from a long-term condition that you find unbearable that will not kill you or not kill you in the uh, immediately foreseeable future, and you can still ask a physician to assist you in dying or to, to give you a lethal injection. Um, there's a requirement uh, that the physician, that there be no reasonable alternative that the patient is prepared to accept. There's a consultation with an independent doctor, um, and it has to be done by a physician in a medically appropriate manner, which is usually done by lethal injection. Although physician-assisted suicide is legal in the Netherlands, generally speaking, doctors think that it's better and more reliable to give the patient a lethal injection, and they don't see any morally significant difference between the two, so that's what they do. Whereas in Oregon and Washington, um, and at present, I think, in Vermont, um, so you have to be 18 uh, or older, you have to be a resident of Oregon and Washington, you can't, that is, people from here can't travel there, you have to be capable, and you have to be diagnosed with a terminal illness that will lead to death within six months, or at least that has to be the opinion of two physicians. Obviously, you've all heard of cases where somebody went to doc doctors, more than one doctor, and they said, you've only got six months to live, and they lived a year or two. So this is not really totally predictable, but that's what has to be said. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the request has to be a kind of enduring one. So there has to be a 15-day separation between two oral requests, um, and there have to be witnesses. Then there has to be a written request. Um, there has to be a psychological examination uh, of the patient. I think that's the next slide. Um, well, uh, to check that there's no uh, psychological impairment. Um, and uh, they have to, the physician has to talk about what the alternatives are for getting, uh, going to a hospice, getting comfort care, and so on. Um, but when all that is complied with, in these states, a uh, lethal medication can be prescribed. And Vermont is actually interestingly slightly different in that um, for the first three years it's following those procedures, but after 2016, um, it's simply going to be left to good professional medical practice. Uh, apparently there was a debate among the advocates of this law in Vermont as to whether the state should be really involved at all. It was a bit more of a kind of keep the government out of uh, doctor-patient relationships sort of attitude. And so the compromise was that, well, for the first three years, we'll have these same guidelines as in Washington and, uh, and Oregon, and after that, we'll leave it to good professional medical practice as laid down by, um, as laid down by doctors. Okay, we have some information um, from uh, Oregon in particular about uh, a lot of questions relating to the practice that has existed there for now, I think, um, something like 12 years. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. So why do people want to die? Um, it's interesting that you know, a lot of people think when they talk about this, it's going to be pain. It's going to be that they're suffering pain that's not relieved. But in fact, it's less than a quarter of the patients who say it's because of pain that they want to die. Um, and loss of autonomy is by far, well, is, is the most important. Um, decreasing ability to participate in things that make life enjoyable. So as I say, said earlier, people don't think they've got much to lose. Uh, loss of dignity, loss of control of bodily functions, which perhaps is related to loss of dignity. And the burden on others is, is there. Um, that's something that we'll talk about in a moment, but it's, it's not a dominant one. So how many deaths occur as a result of physician-assisted suicide or voluntary euthanasia? Well, in um, Oregon, it's extremely few. It's quite rare that somebody dies as a result of this. It's one in 400. Um, in the Netherlands, it's still a small minority of deaths. It's 3% uh, about, or one in 33. Um, 
And in Belgium, it's slightly, it's fewer slightly, it's one in 52 percent. Um, so this is still not very much, um, although you may hear, again, if you read things about the Netherlands, you may hear people saying that euthanasia is out of control in the Netherlands, but it's quite a small percentage of uh, overall deaths. This is a chart for Oregon that is put out by the government, um, looking at the 14 years in which this law has applied. Um, the important thing to notice about this chart is that these uh, bluish bars are the number of prescriptions issued under the legislation, and not the number of deaths. And the number of deaths are these greenish bars. So in every year, there have been significantly more prescriptions issued than deaths resulting. This is not because people take the medicine and survive. Um, that has happened, but I think it's, it's happened in a, a tiny number of cases. Um, I think maybe six or something over these years. Um, but it's because people want the reassurance of having the medication there. So I think a lot of people want control. They want um, to know that if things get really bad, I can end it. And having that there, they are then more comfortable during the remainder of their life, and they die of natural causes. And that does happen in the Netherlands too, not so much that a prescription is, is issued, because as I said, most deaths occur by voluntary euthanasia, but that people have conversations with their doctor in which they say, doctor, at the moment things are not too bad, I want to go on living, but if things go this, go, get significantly worse, will you provide euthanasia for me? And if the doctor says yes, that provides reassurance and they may never actually get to the point where they want it. So, um, so the numbers, I say, are quite small, 77 in the last year, and although they have been increasing somewhat, it's not a very dramatic increase. Um, and this is relevant to the argument that's often used that euthanasia is going to be a slippery slope. Um, I'm not sure whether the suggestion that you made down the front about a reason why we might not permit killing is that it might spread. That's certainly something that is often said, that once you allow people to kill other people, uh, you're going to get more killing going on. And it was certainly often been said uh, in regard to the Netherlands when this was first happening, that uh, at first it would be voluntary, but then it would become non-voluntary, and then it would become involuntary. Then society would start to kill off people who were a nuisance or who were economically burdensome, who were, uh, who were disabled, uh, or ultimately even people of an undesirable uh, racial minority or political views or something like that. But there's no evidence at all that uh, that has happened. Um, in, uh, and as I say, although the number has certainly grown from the time when, as I say, there was a policy of non-prosecution, it's grown from 1.7% to 3%, but um, nothing very dramatic.